Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pharmacology, and to be more specific, I'm going to be going over medications to treat, to treat what? Parkinson's, to treat um, Alzheimer's disease, and to treat multiple sclerosis. So before we get started, guys, you know I'm always going to ask you to please help support my channel, help support me by liking this video. You're going to love it. Press that like button now so you don't forget. Subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. And don't forget, I have audio lessons available on my website at nexusnursinginstitute.com. Before I get started, I want to start off this video with a prayer. If you're not into that, not a problem. Just go ahead and fast forward. If you are, go ahead, close your eyes, bow your head. Somebody made a comment. This was a very good comment. Thank you. Um, I didn't realize how many students listen to my videos while they're driving. They're driving to school or to the gym or wherever. Uh, please, if you are driving, do not close your eyes. I'm talking to the students who are at home or they are, they're in one place and they're watching me on a screen somewhere. But if you're driving or you're doing something that requires your attention, please do not close your eyes. Okay, with that being said. Thank you, Father God. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you, Lord, for this healing and restoration that you brought to my body, Father God, because influenza is trying to take me out, Lord. But you healed me, and I tell you, thank you. Thank you for this opportunity that you've given me once again to be able to record, to be able to explain information in a way that seems to resonate with these students lord and i know it's not me i know it's you and lord i will forever give you that glory father god thank you for this gift that you placed in me and lord i ask that you please help me to use it wisely to use it kindly and help me to remember to always want to help others father god and lord i pray for every single viewer right now lord whatever it is that they're struggling with whether it's you know, they feel like they don't have enough time to study or they have too many, too much pressure. They have family issues at home. Maybe they have issues at work. Whatever it is that they feel is a stumbling block for them to study or for them to even understand this information. Or maybe they understand the information, but they're having a hard time retaining this, this information. Whatever it is, Lord, I ask that you move those obstacles from the way, Lord, because they came to th this page for a specific reason and for a specific purpose. And I ask that you please bless them. You bless them abundantly, Father God, and allow them to be a blessing to others. Lord, please help me to deliver this information in a way that's palatable, in a way that they can understand, and in a way that they can process, and in a way that when they see the same information again, it may not be the same question, but the same concept, they can understand it and answer the question appropriately. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for every single viewer, Lord. And the people who are supporting my viewers, Lord, I ask that you pour a special blessing over them as well. Thank you for your grace and mercy. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. All right, guys. So let's get started. First question. What is the goal of pharmacologic therapy in the treatment of Parkinson's disease? A, to increase the amount of acetylcholine at the presynaptic neuron. B, to reduce the amount of dopamine available at the substantia nigra. C, to balance cholinergic and dopaminergic activity in the brain. Or D, to block dopamine receptors in presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. And guys, the correct answer is C, to balance cholinergic and dopaminergic activity in the brain. So guys, when it comes to Parkinson's, I want you to think of dopamine. The problem is the patient doesn't have enough dopamine. That dopamine is what? Down. So what happens is that dopamine's down and the cholinergic activity is increased. So C is the correct answer because we're trying to get what? A balance. We're trying to increase that dopamine. Dop dopaminergic dopamine we're trying to increase the dopamine in the patient right and with the increase of the dopamine that cholinergic effect will decrease we're trying to bring that balance that's why c is the correct answer choice <coughs> excuse me if you're new to my channel i have a speech impediment i've had it all my life i'm just doing the best with what i got so please forgive me i can't help it all right next question a patient with Parkinson's disease who's been positively responding to drug treatment with levodopa carbidopa sentiment suddenly develops a relapse of symptoms. Which explanation by the nurse is appropriate? A, you have apparently developed resistance to your current medication and will have to change to another drug. B, this is an atypical response. Unfortunately, there are no other options of the drug therapy to treat your disease. 
C, this is called on-off phenomenon. Your healthcare provider can change your medication regimen to help diminish the effect. Or D, you should try to keep your medications at the current dose. These effects will go away with time. And guys, the correct answer is C. This is called the on-off phenomenon. Your healthcare provider can change your medication regimen to help diminish this effect. So what happens, guys, this patient will still be on this drug, just the dosage may be increased and maybe another medication may be added on. Okay, and so C is the correct answer. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices. A, you have apparently developed a resistance to your drug. Oh, let's keep going. Um, to this drug, you develop resistance to your current medication and will have to change to another drug. Number one, that's not true. You haven't developed a resistance and it's not necessary for them to change another drug. Again, what we expect to see happen is that the healthcare provider, whether it's the doctor or the nurse practitioner, or maybe a physician assistant, depending on how they were in. But anyway, the healthcare provider, we expect them to increase that dosage and most likely add another medication on. But one A is false, it's not necessary. Look at B, this is an atypical response. No, it's not. This is actually a very typical response after that patient's been on this medication for a while. So that's false. Let's keep going. It said, unfortunately, there's no other options. Yes, there is. Again, we expect that dosage to be increased and we expect maybe another medication to be added on. Choice D, you should try to keep taking your medication at the current dose. Well, guess what? This medication is not effective at the current dose. That's number one. And number two, as the nurse, why are we giving that patient instructions about their dose? You leave that to the healthcare provider. Stay in your lane. Uh, these effects will go away over time. So guys, the correct answer is C. And you know why. I explained that to you already. <coughs> Excuse me. A patient with Parkinson's disease is prescribed. I'm going to try to pronounce this drug. Primipexol Mirapex, along with the levodopa carbidopa sediment. Which symptom is most likely a manifestation of an adverse effect of these drugs when they're given together? A, diarrhea, B, dyskinesia, C, wheezing, or D, headache? And guys, the correct answer is B, dyskinesia. These are the abnormal movements like the head bobbing or the body swing that you'll see this patient have, or you may see tremors or fidgeting. Okay, those are type, types of dyskinesias. And we see the patient start to develop dyskinesias after they've been on this medication for a while. Now, something else I wanna bring to your attention, besides uh, dyskinesia, something else that we expect to see when these medications are given taken together is um, orthostatic hypotension or postural hypotension where they change positions and we see a decrease in that blood pressure. So guys, safety, safety, safety. B is the correct answer choice. Which statement should the nurse include in the teaching plan for a patient being started on levodopa carbidopa for newly diagnosed patients, uh, newly diagnosed Parkinson's disease? A, take the medication on a full stomach. B, change position slowly. C, the drug may cause the urine to be very dilute. Or D, carbidopa has many adverse effects. And I kind of gave you guys an answer. So everyone should get this right. The correct answer is B, change position slowly. Again, that orthostatic hypotension. You're gonna teach the patient to dangle. You're gonna teach them to get up slowly. You're gonna teach them all of those safety precautions. Now let's look at the wrong answer choice. A, <coughs> I'm sorry, guys. You guys know I'm Haitian. I've had Haitian teas and Haitian soups up to my eyeballs. Whew. Okay, let's keep going. Where was I? Let's go over the wrong answer choices. A, take the medication on a full stomach. Actually, we would prefer the patient to take the medication on an empty stomach because food slows down the absorption of the drug. Now, if the patient has, you know, GI irritation that they just absolutely cannot stand, then of course, we're gonna tell them, okay, take it with food, but preferably 
not with food on an empty stomach because again food decreases or slows down i should say slows down the gi absor uh, absorption of the drug choice c the drug may cause the urine to be very dilute no actually it can cause the urine to be what um very dark okay and then choice d carbidopa has many adverse effects actually carbidopa has minimal adverse effects like i'm making this video and on top of my head i can't even think of any adverse effects i'm sure there have to be adverse effects it's a drug but i can't even think of any on top of my head it has very minimal adverse effects if any so the correct answer guys is change position slowly we're concerned about orthos <coughs> excuse me we're concerned about orthostatic hypotension and safety is always going to be a priority when it comes to um, this type of medication a patient with parkinson's disease by the way, hold on, let me stop for a second. I just started this video, you know, it's a pharmacology video, but let me make sure you guys understand, you know, Parkinson's disease. Again, like I said, patient doesn't have um, enough um, dopamine, right? But the, the symptoms that we see manifested in that patient with Parkinson's disease, I want you to think of TRAP, T-R-A-P. They have the fine tremors, right? Even at rest, you see their hands like that. You see that, um, what do we call it? I'm having a brain fart, but you see they, they do their fingers like this, something pill rolling. You'll see them doing pill rolling, right? So, um, the T is for tremors. The R is rigidity. You'll see they have muscle rigidity. You know, when they're walking, it's, you know, it's not, it's, it's, it doesn't just flow. They're walking like robots, right? They're very rigid. The R is for rigidity. T R A A is for T-R-A, akinesia, so something else that you'll see with this patient, it's hard to get them to move, and when they do move, again, they're very rigid, um, so they really don't have the normal movements how you see normal uh, patients are, and then T-R-A-P, P, postural instability. That's why these patients are such a fall risk and we have to always worry about pay, um, a safety because I can't do it here because I'm doing a video. You know how when you walk and your arms swing naturally when you walk, the reason that your arms swing naturally when you're walking is that's helping you stay balanced, right? You're staying with the center of gravity, you're balanced. Well, these patients, when they walk, first of all, their arms don't swing. So, you know, they're already not being balanced by their arms not swinging. Then they have a shuffling gait where they shuffle like this, right? And then their head tends to be down. You ever seen somebody running track with their head down? Absolutely not, because you get dizzy and fall. You're supposed to look up when you're walking. So they're looking down. They have the, like they're more hunched back and their arms are swinging and they have that shuffling gait. So these patients are big high um, risk for fall. So I just wanted to give you guys a clinical picture of what you expect that patient to look like with um, Parkinson's. Okay, let's keep going with our questions. A patient with a history of Parkinson's disease treated with selegiline elder pro has returned from the operating room after an open reduction of the femur. Which physician order should the nurse question? A, decaffeinated tea, gelatin, cubes, and ginger ale when alert. B, docusate 100 milligrams PO. C, meperidine 50 milligrams IM every four hours is needed for pain. Or D, acetaminophen 650 milligrams every six hours is needed for temperature. And the correct answer, guys, is the meperidine. So first of all, whenever you get a question asking you, which one would you question? Or which one would you seek clarification? What they're really asking you is which one is incorrect. And it's meperidine. Go back to the question. This medication, selegiline, the elder pro, that's an MAOI. I just did a video teaching you guys about the MAOIs, right? Okay. So anyway, this medication is an uh, MAOI and it has um, a drug-drug interaction with meperidine. It can cause hyperthermia, it can cause um, um, irritation. We don't wanna give, I'm saying irritation, agitation. We don't wanna give these two drugs together. So when the physician orders this drug, meperidine, for the patient that's already taking this MAOI, you're not gonna be a robot. You're not just gonna give this medication because of the physician or the healthcare provider ordered it. No, you're gonna think critically. You're gonna to say to yourself, wait a minute, wait a minute. 
I know that this can cause big trouble for my patient if it's given together. I'm going to call the healthcare provider and say, hey, I know you ordered this meparidine for pain, but were you aware that this patient's on the um, Elder Pro? Okay, you're going to withhold it and call the healthcare provider. You're showing the test writer that you understand that there is a very serious drug drug interaction with these two medications. See, the correct answer choice. <coughs> Excuse me. A family member asked the nurse about amandadine. Which statement by the nurse is most helpful in explaining the use of amandadine? A, it was developed by an antiviral agent. It was developed as an antiviral agent, but is now used to, for treatment of Parkinson's disease. B, it works slowly over time, but can lose its effectiveness in three to six months. C, it works rapidly and does not lose its effectiveness. Or D, it's not as effective as other medications, so it's not the first line treatment, but it may be used in addition to other medications. And guys, the correct answer is D. It's not as effective as some other medications. That's why it's not a first line treatment, but it can be used in addition to other medications. Here's the thing, guys, this medication is not as effective as levodopa. At the end of the day, levodopa is our go-to when it comes to Parkinson's disease. Levodopa, dopamine. Remember that's what the patient doesn't have enough of to begin with? Okay, so levodopa is our go-to. Here's the problem with this medication, amantadine. Even though it works very quickly, when I say very quickly, I'm talking about within the first week, right? Wonderful, because when it comes to these CNS medications, they don't work quickly. It takes weeks before we start, you know, um, it really gets in that patient's bloodstream and starts to be effective, right? But this medication, within a week, it starts to be effective. Here's the problem. It wears off very quickly. It wears off very quickly, and it's not as potent. It's not as effective as a drug such as levodopa, all right? But here's something else I want to bring to your attention about this drug before I go over the wrong answer choices. Amantadine, even though it's not as strong, it's not as effective, it wears off very quickly. It's a great dr drug to treat um, um, those adverse effects, the dyskinesia that comes with the medication. Remember the dyskinesia I talked to you about, you know, the body swaying and the fidgeting and those type of um, manifestations? This is a great drug for those manifestations, okay? And what causes those drugs? What causes the, the dyskinesia? Levodopa. So even though the drug Levodopa is perfect, that's our first line for Parkinson's disease itself, Levodopa does cause dyskinesia. And a great drug to treat the dyskinesia is this medication right here, amantadine. Now let's go over the wrong answer choices. A, amantadine was developed by an antiviral, as an antiviral agent, but is now used for treatment of PD. This is true. And this is what NCLEX will do to you often. They will give you an answer is true, but the answer that they give you, is that the most appropriate answer? Go back to the question. It tells you that a family member is asking you about this drug. Do you think that they care? that originally it was an antiviral agent and we now give it for Parkinson's disease. You think they care about it? You think they care about that? No. They're asking you about this drug. They're concerned. So even though A is true, A is not the best answer because it's irrelevant. We don't care about that. Choice B, it works slowly over time. That's false. It works immediately. I'm talking, I, I am saying within the week, but honestly within two, three, maybe even four days, it starts to work. So that's false. It works quickly. Let's get rid of choice B. Look at choice C. It works rapidly. Okay, I'm still with it. And does not lose its effectiveness. That's false. And here's another trick that NCLEX will try to use on you. They will give you a beautiful answer that's true and then put one little thing in there that's false. Guess what? If the whole thing is not true, the whole thing is false. Because at the end of the day, NCLEX wants to make sure that you're a safe nurse. They want to make sure that you're not the type of nurse to say, well, all of this is good, but just this little tiny part is not good. So let me go ahead and do it anyway and go and kill somebody. They want to know that you are a prudent nurse. They want to know that you are the, you know, the type of coworker that you have that 
nobody wants to work with because they're concerned about everything. Everything is a big deal. They're up in your business, the next coworker's business, everybody's business as if they think they're the boss. Let me tell you, NCLEX wants you to be that type of nurse. And what I mean by that is NCLEX wants you to be overly safe. That means there's one tiny little thing is wrong. Whether it's yours or not, you're going to recognize it and address it. You're not going to do it. Okay. Does that make sense? So that's why D is the correct answer choice. The nurse is caring for a group of patients diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. Which neurotransmitter level is decreased by as much as 90% in patients with severe Alzheimer's disease? A, norepinephrine, B, serotonin, C, acetylcholine, or D, dopamine? <coughs> <coughs> And the correct answer is acetylcholine, okay? <clears throat> Excuse me. So what we see in patients that have um, Alzheimer's disease is a drastic reduction in acetylcholine. And when I say drastic, I'm talking about like 90%. Now, yes, as you get older, the acetylcholine level will drop very significantly, very mildly, just a little bit. Not a whole lot, but in the patients that have Alzheimer's disease, we see it drops a lot. So even though we don't understand the pathology 100% of Alzheimer's disease, we do know for a fact that there's a very strong correlation with acetylcholine. There's a high decrease in acetylcholine. Now let's look at the other choices. A, norepinephrine. Um, with the decrease in norepinephrine, that patient would, you know, we'd see something like adrenal insufficiency, right? Serotonin, decrease in serotonin, we see something like depression. Um, dopamine, decreased dopamine, we see something like what? Parkinson's disease, very good. So for this question, the correct answer is C, acetylcholine. Which cholinesterase inhibitor has the highest incidence of adverse GI effects? A, Aricet B, Exelon B, Remino, or D, NMDA? Now, before I tell you what the answer is, let me make this clear. All of these options have GI um, uh, symptoms, GI adverse effects, right? But there is one that has significantly higher risk of GI effects than the others, but all of them have GI effects. And guys, the correct answer is Exelon. Exelon has more, you know, the nausea, the vomiting, excuse me, the anorexia, the weight loss, significantly higher, but all of them have GI effects, okay? Um, before I move on to the next question, also choice D and MDA, that's not even a cholinesterase inhibitor. They just threw that in. All right, let's move on to the next question. Which statement about Namenda is false? A, it's indicated for moderate or severe Alzheimer's. B, it modulates the effects of glutamate. C, it does not slow the decline in function, or D, the most common side effects are dizziness, headache, confusion, and constipation. We're looking for a false answer. Okay, the answer that's incorrect is C. It does not slow the decline in function. Absolutely, it does slow the decline in function. And in some patients, um, Namenda not only slows the decline in function, um, We've also seen improvements in those signs and symptoms that the patient had. So um, C is the incorrect answer choice. Choices A, B, and D are all correct. That's why we didn't choose it as an answer. A family member, <coughs> excuse me, a fa <coughs> excuse me, a family, a family member asked the nurse about amantadine which statement by the nurse is most helpful in explaining the use of amantadine? A, just joking, just joking. I did that question already. I just want to see if you guys are paying attention. 
A patient with a history of numbness, weakness, and blurred vision recently diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. What does the nurse understand to be the underlying pathophysiology of these symptoms? One, an imbalance of dopamine and acetylcholine in the CNS. B, inflammation of body and destruction in the CNS. Three, inability of serotonin to bind to its receptors in chemoreceptor trigger zone. Or four, high frequency discharge from neurons from a specific focus area of the brain. And guys, the correct answer is two. Inflammation and myelin destruction in the CNS. So why do we care about inflammation of the myelin or destruction of the myelin sheet? What, what does that mean to us? Well, guys, that myelin sheet, that's what actually protects those nerves. Remember those nerves? That's what sends the signals, the transmissions um, of impulses, right? So that means a lot. Just think about the thing that's actually supposed to protect the nerves. Now it's damaged. That's what causes that patient to have those symptoms such as num numbing, the numb the numb the numbness the tingling the weakness all of those symptoms that the patient can experience with multiple sclerosis the nurse is caring for a patient hospitalized with acute episode relapse of multiple sclerosis which agent is the preferred treatment during relapse one interferon beta two methylprednisone three copaxone or four tisabro iv infusion and the correct answer guys is to the methyl um prednisone remember methylprednisone what does it end in prednisone this is kind of what glucocorticoid what does it do decrease inflammation what is multiple sclerosis it's inflammation and destruction of the myelin sheath so when that patient's having an acute episode this is what we expect to get, be given it decreases the inflammation guys now you see the other choices choices one three and four this is still given to that patient that has multiple sclerosis but it's given for long-term management but if that patient has an acute episode, something's going on with them right now, we're going to give them that methylprednisone, okay? So two is a correct answer. And by the way, that methylprednisone that we expect to be given, it's going to be in very high doses. A nurse is caring for a patient receiving sop copaxone for a multiple sclerosis. Which finding, if, if present in the patient, could be considered excuse me, a potential adverse effect of this drug. One, flu-like symptoms with fever. Two, <coughs> one, flu-like symptoms with fever. Two, decreased neutrophil count. Three, jaundice and elevated bilirubin. Four, injection site pain and redness. And guys, the correct answer is four. Injection site pain and redness. And let me add something else to, onto it. Um, with um, the injection site irritation, we often all um, we often see pruritus itching in that area. Okay. Choices one, two, and three, these adverse effects we see with that uh, medication, glutiramir. Okay? But with this medication, the Copaxone, it's four. Redness, pain, and pruritus itching at the injection site. One, two, and three, we see that with glutiramir. All right, next question. Tysabro is a very effective agent for treating multiple sclerosis. Which problem is associated with the administration of this drug, making it a second line um, agent? One, increased risk of sudden cardiac death. Two, documented reports of necrotizing colitis. Three, increased risk of Steven Johnson syndrome. Or four, rare cases of dangerous brain infections. And the correct answer is four, rare cases of dangerous brain infection. This drug, guys, it's given, if it has to be given, 
that patient is monitored very, very closely by a very, very specialized um, team. They are very specialized, and it's a very controlled setting with this with with this drug because it's so deadly. For the correct answer. The nurse is teaching a patient about the new medication for mitoxetrone. Which statement made by the patient indicates a need for further teaching? So need for further teaching, they're asking us what? Which one's the wrong answer choice? One, I'll volunteer at a local daycare center once a week. Two, I drink grapefruit juice with breakfast each morning. Three, I enjoy walking and outdoor activities in the sun. Or four, I understand this drug may cause my urine to turn blue. Now, this is a weird question because I'm going to tell you what the answer is, but I'm going to tell you what I have a problem with. The correct answer is one, I volunteer at a local daycare center once a week. And the reason that, wait, by the way, this medication that we're talking about, this is an anti-neoplastic, uh, it's an anti-cancer drug, right? So, with statement needs further teaching, one, I volunteer at a local daycare center once a week. If you're taking this medication, you can't be volunteering at a local daycare center. You can't be around crowds. You can't be around sick people. And you know kids are nasty. They're sick all the time, right? So that one definitely needs further teaching. But here's what I have a problem with. Choice two also needs further teaching. I drink grapefruit juice with breakfast each morning. Um, grapefruit juice interferes with that drug. They shouldn't be drinking grapefruit juice either. So I think this was a poorly written question, but whatever. The reason I still held on to it was because I wanted to make sure that I let you know that not only when they're taking this medication, they shouldn't be around crowds. They shouldn't be around sick people. They should not be drinking or, um, grapefruit juice as well, okay? Choices three and four are true. So that's why I didn't re require, require further teaching. Okay, guys, last question. Which medication used for the management of multiple sclerosis cannot be self-administered? One, fingolimod. Two, tisabril. Three, copaxone. Or four, beterosan. And the correct answer choice is, guys, number two, the Tysabril or Tysabri. This medication has to be given IV and it has to be given um, over an hour. Now, after that medication has been given over an hour, the patient has to be monitored for another hour. Okay, Professor D, um, all right. But guess what? Anybody that is associated with this medication, the prescriber, the nurse that's admit, excuse me, the nurse that's administering it, the pharmacist, the infusion nurse, anybody that is associated with this medication, they have to go through some type of you know specialized training and get a special certification and be registered with the Touch program. I don't know what that Touch program is, but I know it's a highly specialized program that you have to get some type of certification before you can even be involved with this drug to give it to a patient. Okay. Now, your other choices, choice one, that can be given orally, and choice three and four, those can be given subcutaneously. I'm running over my time. Let me do one more question with you guys, and then that'll be it. Which medications can be used to manage fatigue associated with multiple sclerosis? Select all that apply. All right, guys, how do you treat select all that apply? As true or false? Remember, don't try to club them together for it to make sense by itself. If it's true, we're going to keep it. If it's false, you're going to throw it out. So again, they're asking us which medications can be used to manage fatigue associated with multiple sclerosis. One, modafinil. True. The question is asking us about which drug can help with fatigue. Well, this medication, it's a, stim, a CNS stimulant. So, of course, that's going to help with the fatigue. True. How about uh, two, clonazepam? False. Clonazepam is a benzodiazepine. It can help to decrease those um, tremors or a taxi, you know, a taxi where the person looks like they're walking drunk, right? That's a great, med that benzodiazepine is a great medication to decrease those tremors or ataxia, but not the fatigue. How about three, amantadine? 
Absolutely. True. You know this drug, it's an anti-dyskinetic medication. So it decreases those dyskinesia symptoms. Absolutely. And by the way, um, f fatigue is one of those symptoms we see um, with this patient. Absolutely true. How about um, carbamazepine? False. Carbamazepine, that's an anti-epileptic, right? An anti-seizure drug. That can help with that neuropathic pain that the patient may feel. It can decrease the neuropathic pain, but not really address the fatigue. And last, um, Empira. I'm pronouncing that wrong, but you guys see that medication. And that's false. Empira, that's a calcium channel blocker that helps improve, uh, improve, helps to improve the patient's walking but it does not address the fatigue. So for this question, the correct answer is choices one and three. Guys, if you made it to the end of this video, thank you for struggling with me through this video. I appreciate it. I appreciate your support. I've been seeing all your comments wishing me to get well, and I promise, like I'm good now because I was way worse. So every day I'm getting better, I'm getting stronger, I got my voice back. So I appreciate all the words of love and support and encouragement that I've been seeing in my comment section. Thank you so much. Please let me know what you guys thought about this video in the comment section. Let me know what you'd like to see me cover more of. Because I was sick, um, that um, NCLEX review that I was supposed to have for you guys um, yesterday on the 30th, of course it didn't happen. I didn't even have a voice. But I promise I'm going to reschedule for you and I'll let you know when the new date is. Don't forget I have audio lessons available on my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. And I cover a variety of nursing topics every day for free across my social media platforms such as TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook. So be sure to check me out there. Thank you so much for watching my video. You guys will catch me on the next video.